Oksana, you are head of SEO in Nalami, right? Yeah, what head of search you, and SEO. What do you like the most about your job there? I have the freedom to tackle search in different ways. One is external when it comes to search engines. Another one is internal when it comes to our own search engine and the way our users are finding our products um, on the Alamy website. And I really like that because I, I get to see it from both sides. How often is that the user is searching something in Google with a site to dots alamy.com or is your search like so profound that they prefer yours it's such a good question it does happen it does happen quite a bit they don't do a site search specifically i don't think they realize there's the site operator but you do see them searching for the brand so they search alamy and then they put a descriptive query in there so i know they're looking for something and they know we have it but they they just directly search on google instead of first coming to alamy and then doing the search so i i put that down sometimes to just them trying to be more efficient and not have to click around as much. And I think that's what Google did to people. They, they created a search that's so good, you don't really have to go to websites anymore to search for things. Can uh, people download from Google your images or do they have to go to no, the website? No, they still anyway. have to click and come and download them from us. So that is still um, a good thing. But I don't know if you remember, but before 2018, you images on Google were not linked to an HTML page. They were not linked to a website. It was just a JPEG file hosted on a website, but you just see it in Google. So that changed in February, 2018, I believe. And since then it actually, you have to go to that website if you want that image. So that was a good move. Thank you, Google. Uh, there is um, like common misconception that you cannot promote your websites in search if you are doing that on stock images and especially if they are watermarked but like your whole website is stock images and they are watermarked what can you tell about that and it's not just me right all my competitors we all do it um and all of our images are watermarked because this is how we try to protect our contributors our photographers the people we work with in in getting these images and you you search for um, any anything descriptive in image search, you're going to find the stock photography website, which is proof that it doesn't matter if it's watermark, it doesn't matter if it's the same photo in three different places, it will show up in search if it's relevant to that search term. I may I ask like very difficult questions? Compared to pages where there is stock photo and the other page that has a unique photo made by the person themselves, is there any difference in rankings for the page, not for the image? I think the problem is we're focusing on the image and not on the whole story. The image itself, I don't think it does much unless everything around it has value to that search term that you're trying to rank for to the user who's trying to find your content. So let's say you have the same one image used in two different articles. Uh, in one, the image is highly relevant to the article. In another, the same image is not that relevant. It's just like a fluff thing you add on the page to, to, to break the text. From a user point of view, if I'm searching an image search, I'd like to find image that's relevant to the article. Because if I see that image and I'm thinking, yeah, I want to read about stuff that has to do with that image, I want a relevant article. I would hate to find the image, click on it, and then realize it's just for decor, it's just design. It doesn't actually, it's not relevant, right? So I think it's the same, um, even if it's different images. Um, if you just use it to break text apart, to make your page look nice, you, you shouldn't rank with that image for anything related to your text if the image is not absolutely relevant. But that's, you know, that's my opinion. And I think that's what Google's looking at, right? Users should get something that's relevant. But can you like promote the whole website on stock images at the moment? So I have some content. I don't have that much photography skills. I don't want to hire any person to go around somewhere and make photos for me. It's quite difficult and then it's quite costly. But if I use stock photos, will it impact my rankings in a negative way? I'm, I'm going to say that dreaded thing that we all say, it depends. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, I, and I, I always make a point, I, I try to say, let's not go there. Let's find, let's find a better answer than it depends, but it does depend. 
let's say you have um, you have a review website um, and you're providing product reviews and we know Google really cares about these types of websites there's a whole update around just product review websites instead of you actually buying that product using it and then giving an honest review you use a stock photo of that product and you give a review of that product, but because it's a stock photo, I have no trust that that the person reviewing it actually ever touched the product. So in this case, I would say a stock photo should not rank for that product review ever because it, the product review itself shouldn't rank for anything ever. So it's not about the image itself. It's about the fact that they're, they're using a stock photo to deceive the, the user. But if let's say I'm, I'm writing a travel blog, I've visited Turkey, um, and then I, I, I get an aerial image of Turkey, of a city in Turkey from a stock photo website because I don't have a drone, I can't afford a helicopter ride, right? But my review is about my experience in that city. In that case, I think that photo is highly relevant to the review. It's not deceiving anybody. It, it does bring value because it shows you kind of the how the city is laid out or it gives you a, a, a nice idea of what th this thing that's being reviewed looks like. And I think in that case, it doesn't matter it's a stock photo. It's actually, it's better because how else would you get a photo like that? And in that there case, you should some, rank with it. There are so many services right now where you throw your any photo, it can be a stock photo, and it changes this, it for you to make it like more unique some AI generators and all these kind of things. Does Alami plan to integrate something in their services like that to like mm, help users to make these stock photos more unique? It's not something I can completely give details about because I think it's more in discussion um, at this point. So it's nothing set in stone, but just in general, the future of stock photography. Um, and if we're looking at what some of our competitors are already doing and how they've came into the market, I think it's it's worth pointing that with all these generative AI um, services out there, there's a problem of copyright currently that's being disputed um, at different levels. You have uh, Getty Images uh, that has taken Midjourney to court because a lot of the images that Getty has out there, even though Watermark, have been used to train Midjourney. And that's one example. We know pretty much every stock photography website was was caught in, in some sort of training for any of the models that we have out there now. And there's a problem of attribution, I guess, who, you know, you have all these photographers, they created all this work that's now being used by generative AI with no attribution back to them in any way. And that is something that Shutterstock, for instance, took and they created their own model using their own images from their own photographers. And now they are able to calculate attribution back to the original images and who those belong to. So I think that's kind of a model of the, in, you know, a model to look at when it comes to stock photography, because you can create new things, but to create those new images, you need a basis in reality, the images that went into training and those belong to somebody and those people deserve recognition and you know they deserve to be paid for it as well. So I think when it comes to stock photography, that's the future. You train on something you can control so you can uh, attribute back. While a lot of these big models like Dali and, and Mid Journey, they just trained on the whole web with no real way of looking and saying, 90% of this image was created from these 1,000 images that we can attribute back to somebody, as an example. Even if they are taken to court some point in the future, like it will take several years, like for all these hearings, for everything, you can't, like uh, some people who are proponents of this thing, they say you cannot stop the progress, you know, so it's already happened, they already stole the content. They have already trained these models and you cannot take them down or do anything. There will appear lots of open source versions of these models, yeah, and all these kind of things. So it's inevitably that some people will eventually not get paid for, but for their impact <laughs> into this progress. Like, do you plan to make any kinds of digital watermarks for the 
images in Aerosum, authors, they started to insert the digital watermarks uh, that they are, images are generated so that when these uh, mid-journey boats or other boats meet their images, they don't take them into the training set. And um, like, what's your stance on it? What's your stance on the usage of images in, in search, generated images? And what do you think about that in, in general? So I'm, I'm not speaking for Alamy specifically here, but because I'm in the industry and keeping an eye out on all advancements when it comes to this, um, the um, IPTC people, uh, the ones that kind of, um, <laughs> they keep track of metadata that gets embedded in images and kind of format and what kind of information is being passed through that. Um, they've had a uh, conference um, a few weeks back, so this is quite recent, and they were talking about um, introducing metadata to mark AI-generated synthetic media. So it would apply for um, anything that's created uh, by AI. And they, they want to introduce this metadata in IPTC. And then Google wants to grab this metadata from IPTC and then show it in search as a label that says AI generated, similar to how they, they have a label now that shows um, that the image is uh, licensable, for instance, that it can just go and license an image. So there are plans to do that. But that's, of course, if people do add this information and a lot might not add it. So I know there's also work on creating like a, I don't know what to call it, like a digital footprint uh, that's added to images generated through various models. Um, and then it would be harder to remove this as you use the image in, in various places. Because with IPTC, it's quite easy to remove it if you want to. So I know that's being in the works. I have not seen it. Um, I haven't yet had the chance to actually play with an image that has that information and try to change it somehow and see what happens to that information, if it stays on or not. But I think that's the future, Some some sort of embedded information that whatever you do with that image, it, it sticks to it. So you know at least the original of that image was AI generated and any modifications it suffered after, um, you know. I actually tried the digital footprint, at, at least those versions that are available right now, so you can download them and um, like uh, create an image with them. So you have already an image and you can insert this digital footprint into the image. It takes like lots of time, but uh, what I found out like for me, maybe I'll reuse the wrong version, but when you try to change the format of the image, like you had JPG and you make it PNG, for example, convert it into PNG, it loses the digital footprint most so of the time. So it's even to rid of it. Yeah, so it, it's uh, it's very hard to maintain. There are different versions of it. Some of them remain when you change the format, some of them not. But for others, but for the hardest thing, like it's programmatical and uh, quite hard to explain. But uh, some of them, you just move the image slightly, then you resize it, and then you cut it, and it again yeah. loses this footprint. So it's like, uh, uh, so... I tried a few of them and they all <laughs> failed at one time or another. So, but uh, it's okay for the stealer, but maybe the bots, the actual bots that do that, they when they see this image, they won't take it into this training set. They won't try to alter the formats, I hope so, or like resize or anything else, I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to see what happens because you said, you know, taking somebody to court might take years before we have a resolution. But remember how I said about um, image search, actually linking to a page now to a website rather than just showing the, the image file. That was actually something that Getty um, pushed as well. So they, they kind of wanted to sue Google on it and said, you know, it's not fair. You you link to my images and you use my images in search, but I have no attribution whatsoever. Nobody can click through, see my website or anything. And that was, Google said, you know what, you're right. Let's partner up and come up with a solution for this. And that's how we got HTML pages to be linked from image search. So I'm kind of, you know, I'm more hopeful that um, when, when big organizations get involved, um, people are not necessarily going to drag it out, but they will try to work together um, to find a solution. So we'll see what happens. And I hope it happens quite soon and we don't have to wait years for it. But ideally, 
um, these models should be trained on images that can be traced back to the originators so they get attribution and they get um, paid for their work that was used here. Uh, how can uh, creators of the images, photographers and whoever, painters, protect their work from being used in training sets? Can they? Um, can they? <laughs> I mean, if you can find it online, it's publicly available. <laughs> what can you do? I mean, even, even with stock photography websites, we put a watermark on it. And then I think there was a, an example of, a, of an image generated with one of these models that almost reproduced the Getty Images watermark in the new image because it used as an element. I think all that people can do is copyright as visible as possible. We know Google is making um, a lot of movement in this area, trying to show um, copyright information, grabbing it from IPTC metadata and showing it in image search. There's websites you can go and check if your images have been used in training. Um, so then maybe that's one thing and then you can, I don't know, um, write those, uh, the owners of those models and say, hey, I haven't consented to this. But because the law side of it is still in the air, I don't know if it, it's enough just to say, hey, I don't give consent, or if we actually need a law to be passed that says you're not allowed to do it if the person doesn't give you consent. So I don't know. I guess we'll have to see what happens. But you can now like install stable diffusion on your PC locally, and you just don't reveal what you use for your training data and train your own set yourself. It's like, yeah. I mean, you know, whatever you do at home, who knows, right? Yeah, so it's like. We, no. We've all been you know, copying images Why off of I'm Google. Right, and in using what? them in presentations and maybe putting them as posters in our houses without actually considering, wait, somebody created this, I should license it properly and pay that person. We've all done it. Why wouldn't these models do it on larger scale? IPTC, because we were talking about IPTC, and you mentioned that uh, Google is looking into this data. What, what do you know about if they are looking at every other data in IPTC? Because IPTC is quite extensive. They have lots of fields. They have lots of attributes there. Um, does Google look into every other field or do they ignore some of that? They look at uh, three things that I know of. Well, two things. This is the third one that they will be looking at. So it's not yet happening, but they did say they, they have an interest in it. Uh, one is the two fields that give you that licensable tag on images. So that's the um, where you can license an image from and what uh, rules uh, apply to that licensing. So you can um, embed information, sending users to two different pages on your website. One will will talk about how does the license apply and one shows you where you can get it and license it from. And to give a, a clearer example, um, if I have a portfolio of images on my website that I'm ranking with, I might point to my page to show uh, what type of license governs those images. But then if you want to buy that, uh, I might point it to a stock photography website that I'm using for that because I don't have my own e-commerce platform. And then uh, I might point it to Alamy and say, you can buy my image from here if you want to. So that information can be given through IPTC, but Google also accepts that from schema from HTML. So just uh, using uh, schema.org. Um, with structured data. Then um, you can also get information about the creator of an image and the copyright, who it applies to, and that kind of stuff. And this is currently coming from IPTC. So that information, if it exists uh, embedded in the IPTC of a metadata of an image, Google can pull it in and you usually see it when you click on an image in image search and you go in that preview panel underneath, you can see that information being pulled in. So Google is really trying to show you who the creator of the image is and who the copyright belongs to. Um, and then this would be, I guess, the third that I know of uh, where Google will try to read that IPTC information to then show that the image was AI generated or it's it's some sort of synthetic media. What happens if the person steals an image from you, for example, removes watermarks and um, like uses IPTC to write that they are the creator, the author, and 
ha have this attribution as if the, it's their image. Well, then they appear as if it's their image, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, in, in stock photography companies, there's a thing, um, there's a department of infringements. So we do work in trying to see if our images have been used in places where um, maybe a proper license uh, hasn't been used or if they've been used without a license. But, um, you know, it, this is semi-automated work, let's say. It can't really cover the whole web. So there might be cases where people do this and, and they get away with it. But then I was at a, at a conference a few months back and somebody approached me and said, hey, I'm actually an Alumi client. I've been with you guys for years. And I just want to say your colleagues, I don't know how they did it, but I used an image once without actually buying it and they found me. And I thought... What's your website? And they didn't, you know, it wasn't a big famous website. It wasn't very big to to kind of think. It's a lot of pages indexed in Google. So I'm thinking if if my colleagues managed to find that person when they did it, um, this process works most of the times. It's funny. So he's also proved that stock photography works. <laughs> it can be found. <laughs> oh. Yeah, exactly. What can you use instead of Google to find the source of the photo? Ah, I see. Yes. So, uh, yeah, it was Google Lens, right? So, first of all, Google has pushed Lens everywhere. Um, it used to be just kind of in the Google app on the phone. Then they put it in the Google search on, on mobile. And now it's in Google search on desktop as well. It's pretty much anywhere you see images, you can just use um, Google Lens as well. You can see it in traffic too. Um, if you use Google Lens in image search, instead of anything you do through Google Lens in image search, instead of that coming to your organic traffic, it actually goes to your referrer traffic and you can see it as Google Lens. And at every stage where they, they've done a change in, in where Google Lens appears, I've seen traffic change as well. So it, clearly people are using it um, and it's a, it's a growing source of traffic um, at the moment. So more and more people are using it. Um, I think even when you get an image, if you if you click the image in the lens um, overlay that you get um, in image search, when you click on it, you do get a visit button, so you can just go to that website. But I think it's harder for the related images to know where they're coming from. Is that what you mean in terms of attribution? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. unless you kind of put it in view, you you don't exactly know where that's coming from. You have to click on it. You have to interact with it to be able to then go to that website and see what happens. I mean, it's uh, not great. It just, yeah, it's not great. It doesn't work sometimes, like lots of times when you're trying to see. And uh, with Google Lens, what they are trying to push more is uh, they are trying to, instead of, for example, showing you who the person on the photo is, they try to make you buy what he is wearing or she is wearing. <laughs> I've, I've had it lots of, oh, you can buy this blouse here, here, here. <laughs> and the, uh, the whole search, instead of this person, I have these blouses from all these kind of shops. <laughs> and you're trying <laughs> to find a related image. And instead of that, you find related products from that image, right? Yes, like you, yeah. you get um, a list. Yeah. Um, and I know you do a lot of work in this area. You probably um, have played with Google Lens way more than I have, <laughs> for sure. Um, but from what I no, noticed... No. It, it is somewhat related to the search you do. If the search is a bit generic and the intent behind the search um, is not very clear, then you might end up in product land because um, Google just wants to make more money. Don't we all, yep. right? But then if you do more descriptive searches, I think it understands better that you're looking for an image and related images rather than the products inside the image. But that's what I noticed from my limited um, research. For us in the industry, I, I do find it useful. Um, I think it does help researchers um, when they're trying to find imagery and they they if, if they don't have a website in mind that they want to buy from and they're just more interested in who has the, the imagery they need, I think it's an invaluable tool. It actually works and it's helpful. But yeah, if you don't have a very clear goal and you're just kind of playing around, you kind of get stuck in, in lens and you can't really get out and go back to where you were. It's not as and, easy. And uh, the traffic, the traffic is, not, is not shown in uh, Google Search Console. It's only in these referrals. 
Yeah, I always I always wondered. I think it is captured there. It just it's not separated as lens. So you don't know it's lens. Like there's it's not in search appearance or you know, like it's not in any of those um different areas of search console to tell you. But I think anything you search and then you go to lens, that search is gonna be in there. You just don't know somebody went to lens from it. Yes, because sometimes people use also lens to translate things, you know to do um, other things and you just I don't know how to track it even it's but it's interesting at least what do you think about Bing images and uh, Bing AI search and everything related to that in relation to what you do I have problems with Bing I have a love-hate relationship with Bing because I think it's it's image search is great but it's crawling capability is lazy um, at best. So I, I think Google is is more proactive when it comes to crawling the web and identifying pages and wanting to get that information out there for users. And it, it does, it, it takes that extra step and it bypasses some issues and it really tries to find that information. With Bing, I think, if it's not pristine or easy or straightforward, Bing won't put in the work to find it. Um, and I, I think that's where I'm, I'm I'm not loving it because I have a lot of images, but Bing doesn't know about most of them, what, whereas Google does because Google has taken the extra step, has done the work, has found them, and Bing just kind of gave up quite quickly. Um, and I, I, I am actually looking now in how can I help Bing <laughs> better understand what's going on and help Bing crawl more and index more because um, I do think their search is quite good. Um, just kind of looking at metrics, um, I think they're comparable to Google's. So I think Bing should be used um, for image search and, and for things like that. But I unfortunately, I'm just now paying more attention to it. And until now, I really just, I, I only cared about Google mostly. And I thought if Bing likes it, they'll they'll catch up pretty much, but I think it needs extra help. Even the existence of the indexing API is because Bing knows it doesn't have the same kind of crawling ability that Google does. So then they, they put this API for everybody to use to help Bing find these pages. You know, a lot of stuff you do for Google works for Bing as well, right? Like if it's, if it's good and it's user oriented and it's great performance, it will work for Bing. I think that the difference in itself is Bing being a, a little bit lazy. Maybe it cares more about um, speed and size of resources than Google does. So I think that's maybe an area if anybody's looking to get more images on Bing to kind of investigate. So I think how fast can, can Bing get crawl your website so that you know server response time and how can you optimize that but also once it finds your images um, are those compressed um, you know are there smaller files that uh, Bing can fetch faster through the network um, and maybe that's another difference that if you read Google's documentation, they always say large and quality images, right? So they do talk about compression and stuff, but they always also push the idea of images have to be great quality, which means you can't really compress too much because then you lose this quality. In Bing's documentation, they never talk about quality. They always talk about file size and speed and things like that. So I think that's where the difference is. If if you're aiming for Google mostly, then keep quality, but that might hurt your Bing experience for images. But if you're primarily targeting Bing, compress those images to nothing <laughs> if you can. <laughs> but that might give you a bad UX when your images look all grainy. Um, so, you know, there's always there has to be a balance. Um, back to our Google search and stock images. We have two different uh, goals, usually. We need to rank a page for some keyword, and some people do need to rank images, and some people don't need to rank images. Like uh, stock photography or stock images, they seem a very good uh, idea for people who don't need to rank images, though they can rank them, even stock images. And I've showed you an example when you just increase the, the size and place the image uh, contextually very, very um, in the query. 
under the query that you want to rank for. And you can rank into the images just with your alt context and the size of the image and its quality, of course. Uh, but stock photography seems to be a very good way for people to rank web pages quite well, for, uh, even for very difficult keywords, right? Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm not just saying it because I work for a stock photography website. I'm saying it because since I started working here, I really looked into this debate because everybody says, don't use stock photos if you want your SEO to work. And I, I've been looking into it and trying to understand it. Is it true or not? And it's not. You can rank stock photos no problem as long as they're relevant for your page. Because the, the thing that most people forget is that you can rank a page without a, a, an image, but you can't rank an image without a page. And that's the important bit. Because you're not actually ranking the image, you're ranking the page as a whole. And if that image is relevant, then you're also going to have that image in image search, or it might be um, brought in as a thumbnail in web search, or it might show as a beautiful image in discover or whatever it might be. But it's related to the page itself, not just to the image. So then if that image is not relevant to the page, it, it is really not going to show up. But if it is relevant, who cares if it's a stock photo or not? Because what even is a stock photo nowadays? A lot of our business is actually news. We have images of events happening before news outlets have them. They come to us to get them. They're using our images that come from a stock photography website, right? That they they actually use in news publications. You might see them in, in um, media and other places. Um, we have a lot of archive. So if you if you're writing um, a blog post about some historical event, how are you going to get a picture yourself from World War II when that was 1944 and now it's 2013? Like how, right? You would have to go get a stock photo. That doesn't mean you're not going to rank well for your blog post if it's a very good one. And you will ask also uh, be able to show up with that image in image search when somebody searches for related things to your blog post, if it's relevant. So I'm absolutely convinced that stock photography can rank, can rank well, can bring in organic traffic and are good for SEO as long as they're used to enrich the user experience and not to trick the user in some way. Also, when I buy a photo from you, from Alami, uh, for my article and make it a fitted image, I then want to um, use it to, to promote in social media, for example, in YouTube, in TikTok, I don't know where, uh, in so any social media. Uh, do I have the right to do that? Or do I have to buy any, anything uh, like, I don't know, more rights for the image or something like that? <laughs> this is where licensing comes in because um, you have different types of licenses. You can, you can get a license um, on the image size that you're using. It, and then it doesn't matter where you use it. So if, um, if for instance, you want to do a poster, you'd go for a bigger image size, but then if you use that poster in different places or um, if you use it on a billboard and a poster and something else, if you got it based on size, that's fine. Or you can get a license based on usage. Uh, and that would be, you know, you can get a personal license. If, for instance, I just want to change the pictures behind me and use an, a, a picture from Alamy, I'd get a personal license because it's only pretty much for my view and sometimes you <laughs> when we're on a call, right? Um, or you can get like a marketing license and that would cover usage on social media like you just mentioned. So you'll be able to use it on your website and then you'd have related imagery uh, on social to your website. So then you can reuse the same image in different places. Um, you can get it for presentations because I mentioned that before and that's a, a specific license that you can get. Or if you're going bigger, you're publishing books, you're doing things, you can get it um, for that specific and it, it's based on um, how many, you know, how many copies you're making of it when you're going to print or things like that. So for every usage, there's a license, 
that will entitle you to use it in that case without you having to worry. And if you're not sure, um, at least for Alamy, you can always get in touch with our customer support and they're more than happy to kind of point you to the right license based on what you need or calculate you and create you a custom license if, if there may be in between licenses um, on your usage and you don't want to go up, but you don't want to go down and risk it either. So read the licenses and what they mean. I guess that's my best advice here. Um, and you'll find one that that works in your situation. I guess SEOs don't do that at all. <laughs> they just click the button. Just give me the picture. It. <laughs> yeah, that's it. What life? <laughs> that, that's the thing. People think we're selling pictures, but we're selling the rights for you to use the image. Uh, the image still belongs um, to the photographer that, that has taken. We're just kind of uh, managing the rights for you. For example, if there are some SEOs who are photographers as well, like things happen and they want to be on your website is it very easy to uh, become <laughs> a giver not only taker i'm going to say it? this and i i hope nick doesn't mind me saying it but you know nick wilson um i i think oh. we actually have a couple of photos of him because at some point he submitted some, submitted some stock photography um of, of him and his wife um, and mm -hmm. I hope this is, I hope this is not private information because I'm pretty sure he shared it on Twitter once, so it's public now. <laughs> but um, he's, you know, he's into SEO and he has stock photography on Alamy, so I would say it's pretty easy to do. Um, of course, um, every stock photography website will have some sort of quality assurance process, quality control. So for new photographers, um, there might be a small period where they have to wait for their submissions to be accepted. But as you submit more often um, and you're, you're seen as a trusted contributor, then um, it becomes easier and easier um, to do submissions. Um, I would suggest if, if you ever want to do this, you or anybody else listening, um, your SEOs, you understand the importance of content. So don't just submit an image, but submit the content around that image. So make sure you have a descriptive caption, you provide keywords that are relevant to the image and any other information that the website you're submitting to allows you to do. And make sure you, you kind of, I don't want to say optimize like we do in SEO, but have, have the potential client in mind when you write this and, and don't, don't go with subjective captions and, and the way you see it. Go with more objective ones so then they match most people who might be looking for it um, as an example. But content matters for images. Um, you, you're not going to find just an image if it doesn't have the information next to it that's relevant to it, just, just like in SEO. Will it help them to get more backlinks? I don't know. <laughs> Something like that for that product. <laughs> no, uh, we don't link back to other websites. I mean, we don't link back to portfolio sites, if that makes sense. Um, our users can create a portfolio on the Alamy website and then they link to that. Um, from other places. So we give them the platform where they can um, showcase their portfolio as well. Uh, Do you think back people... things that when, when people just use their images? Yeah, like, yeah, for attribution and make it into the license that you have to link to. <laughs> Well, if um, <laughs> if it's on the Alamy website, then the backlinks will come to us, right? If we're the ones okay. hosting the image that's being used. So might be a way to do it from your own website if you offer it. I've also seen people trying to, um, like, you know, product place some products into stock photography so that when people use their images, their product is also visible and it's... I thought it's kind of an interesting kind of advertising for, for some people where you just have the image which is bought or it's on the free for stock photography website and it has this product and it's in some related context. I thought it's, it's a wonderful that, idea actually. It, it is. It's pretty sneaky as well. Um, I think when it comes to product placement, um, 
some images might not actually be able to be used in different places. So like you said before, with if you use something for educational purposes, you can actually use it without getting the license. You can, it's enough to have attribution. So I think it's something similar when it comes to product placement. If it's somebody else's product in the image, you can't actually use it commercially. So um, I can have uh, an ad, an SEO ad that um, shows, I don't know, somebody with a bottle of Coca-Cola because Coca-Cola hasn't actually agreed for me to use it in my own ad. So it would be the same. They could have a picture with a product, but it might not be used in places where a lot of people get to see it anyway. But it, I guess <laughs> as everything else, it depends here as well. <laughs> Is there anything else that I haven't asked you about but you wanted to say? You just um, probably going to repeat myself, but just to tell people to stop being afraid of stock photography when it comes to SEO, because the problem is not the image. The problem is how it's being used. Um, if you use it to pretend you've done something or to kind of fool users in any way, you don't deserve to rank anyway. So it doesn't matter if you're using a stock photo or you did a quick photo or whatever it might be. But if you need a relevant image for something and there's no way for you to get that image, but you have to go get it from a stock photography website and hear, you know, archive and historical in news, for instance, that's a, a very easy example. But it might be that you're, you're writing about some tribe from somewhere and you get a, an authentic image of that of the people in that tribe from a stock photo website because we have images from all over the world. So whatever the situation, don't be afraid of stock images as long as you use them to enrich user experience and not to fool users into believing you've done something that never happened, if that makes sense. Thank you so much. It was so nice to have you and I was so happy to see you as well. Same here.